sermons consists of supporting affidavits and that supporting affidavits has documents that are annexed to it. In some instances, parties, this is the parents of the child have agreed and you have gone before a children officer and recorded an agreement or just between the two of you, you have an agreement. Now to make this agreement enforceable, I always advise go to court and have it adopted as an order of the court. So that where later on there's an uncompliance or you want it varied, it will be very easy. You just go to court and file again an application based on the orders you're seeking in court. You can file, you can have an agreement before the children officer, which is very good and there's compliance. But remember at the instance where there's non-compliance, you cannot rush to court and ask the court to enforce that agreement. You will just have to start and file a suit. But if you have an agreement and it's been recorded in court and there's non-compliance, then it's easy. You just go to court and make an application that there's been an uncompliance or the application you make again, it's notice to show cause. Or where you want the orders to be reviewed. Probably you have three children as a mother and the court granted that the father be paying you 10,000 per month. And as we are all aware, we all live in the same Kenya and costs are going up every day, but the court did not make provision for annual increment based on inflation. So where there's such an agreement subsisting, which was also recorded as an order of the court, it's very easy you go to court and make an application. The kind of application you'll be making in this instance, where you'd wish for court to review the orders it had earlier made is known as an application for review. You're asking the court to review the orders they'd made. And so those will be your prayers. And of course, with supporting documents. Now, there are litigants, yes, who'd like to go to court, but because of the economic hardship, they are not able to uh, hire counsel. There's something we know as legal aid. Unfortunately, in Kenya, the legal aid that is provided is underfunded, so we don't have a lot of organizations. We have FIDA that provides, but FIDA has only three offices in Kenya, Nairobi, Mombasa, and Kisumu. Now, on any given day, FIDA would have a minimum of 20 new clients walking into their offices. And these new clients all want maintenance for children. So what FIDA does, they train them so that they self-represent. The other organization which you can seek for help is NLAS, which is National Legal Aid Service. This is a government body. This one also, you visit their offices. It's under the Attorney General's office. They have offices in Nairobi. I'm not sure of the location of offices outside Nairobi. And they will also assist you. Often times they will just help you in drafting the documents and train you on self-representation. The reason why they train you on self-representation is one, to empower you. And two, the number of people seeking legal services are beyond the capacity of endless or feeder. So, Lastly, when you go to court, assuming you are a man, because men also go to court, though often, more often than not, it's women who institute cases in the children court, but men also go to court. So what are some of the orders that you can seek? When you go to court, assuming you don't have an advocate, what prayers would you seek? As a man, often men go to court because they've been denied access to their children. So the main order that a man would be seeking is access to the children and any other order, because you know best what your circumstances are and what has prompted you to go to court in the first place. Now, if the person going to court in the first place is a woman, the orders often that women seek is maintenance because the men like to abdicate their roles. Children are going to school, they don't want to pay fee. And there's the option of paying the school fee directly. 
And sometimes this is a responsibility that they were already undertaking before the relationship went south, or if you are married, before you separated. So you go to court and seek for maintenance. Now, when you seek for maintenance, what kind of maintenance would you be seeking? Is rent part of maintenance because you are living with the children? Uh, is a provision for house help maintenance that you should seek? Uh, paying for Wi-Fi, DSTV, entertainment. I'm not going to answer those now. I think I'd like to address them in the Q&A session, or I can already see Honorable Getonka here, the principal magistrate and head of station Nairobi Children Court. He will add his voice to that on what kind of orders you should, what kind of prayers you should be seeking when you go to court to ask for orders, whatever orders it is that you're seeking. So without much further ado, I think I'm going to end my session here. I believe a lot more will come during Q&A, which some of the Q&A sessions, questions had already been passed to us prior to this session. So thank you very much. And back to you, LSK Nairobi branch, Asante Nisana. Um, thank you so much, Madam Enrica, for the insightful presentation that you had, capturing so much in such a limited time. Uh, a lot of questions that were asked have been um, answered, and those that have not been answered will be responded to during the Q&A session. So it's interesting to note that whatever you said about men not approaching court often, approaching court often, it's true, and enough participants actually asked, is it is it that men are not allowed to do it or what is it? So that was an interesting observation and I was smiling when you were just mentioning about it. So um, the next presenter is uh, Mr. Philip Nzenge. Mr. Philip Nzenge, um, I'm going to read uh, something small about him. Mr. Nzenge is a married man, a family man, a father to three. He's currently serving as a deputy director in the Department of Children's Services that lies under the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection. He's deployed in Mombasa County as the county children's coordinator. He's also worked as a secondary school teacher in the past for nine years prior to his uh, current job as a children's officer. So his academic background is that he has a bachelor's degree in education from Kenyatta University. Um, he holds a master's degree in public administration from a university, a master's of science uh, in governance, peace and security studies uh, that is ongoing from the African Nazarene University. So there are various things that he's been acknowledged for. And the first one is that um, he holds a certificate in juvenile justice treatment systems from Japan. A second one is that uh, he has a certificate in financial inclusion and economic opportunities from South Africa. Then um, under the special duties is that he is a member of the Safer Cities Board under the County Government of Mombasa, where he was appointed by His Excellency Governor um, Ali Joho. Other recognitions that we cannot fail to mention are that he attended the uh, Street Children World Cup as a special guest in Moscow, that's in Russia. Then uh, he's been recognized three times by different PSCs for outstanding performance in child protection. Then a um, last one is that uh, he represented the country in the year 2009 at the AU meeting in Addis Ababa uh, under the Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of the Child. So Mr. Nzenge, who is a very passionate uh, children's officer based in Mombasa County, believes that the boys and the girls you see today are the couples of tomorrow. Quite interesting. The boys and the girls you see today are the couples of tomorrow. So at this point, I want to welcome Mr. Philip Nzenge all the way from Mombasa to come and join us and uh, we'll listen from him. Kadri Pustana, Mr. Nzenge.
Hello, Mr. Nrenge, if you can hear me kindly. Oh, thank you. Um, hello. Hello, Mr. Nzenge. He seems to be having some tech issues, connectivity. He's unmuted, he's online, but for some reason. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Can we oh. uh, hello, Mr. Philip. We're, yes. We're really struggling to hear you. Maybe you could leave the forum and try reconnecting to see okay. if the connection would be better. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, now I can. Well, he dropped off. So, as we wait for Mr. Nzenge to come on board, uh, please allow me to move on to our next speaker in the interest of time. Um, um, Karibu sana, Honorable Gitonga. So, Honorable Yaha Gitonga is currently the in charge at the Milimani Children's Court. He attained his undergraduate in law from the Makerere University. He graduated with his LLM from the University of Nairobi and is currently pursuing his doctorate. Honorable Gitonga was recently promoted to become a principal magistrate and is an adult um, and is a He's passionate about children matters. So at this point again, allow me to welcome um, Honorable Kitonga this afternoon to come and share with us the role of the judiciary in custody and maintenance um, of children. Karibu sana. Thank you, thank you. LSK in Nairobi branch, our good partners in the practice of law in Nairobi. Uh, I also appreciate the presentation that was made by my good friend, Esther Dulo, um, who has been with us at the Children's Court practicing law for quite a number of years now. And I most sincerely uh, wish to express my gratitude for you to have considered it, uh, considered it necessary to involve the judiciary in this kind of um, uh, webinar. I'm happy to join up with the members of the public as well as the advocates who found the time. Uh, for us who sit at the courts, it is usually an honor for an opportunity like this to, to be able to express ourselves and to share with you our, our experiences, more especially because ordinarily a judge or a magistrate only speaks through their judgments. And um, that's the only forum we are allowed to speak. But when we get an opportunity to share with the members of the public, especially on what happens in the court, for a very long time, courts have been mysteries to most people. You only hear in the village that someone was taken to court and you feel that uh, it's like a disaster which has befallen them. But I think with the time we have uh, demystified the role of the, the courts and the judiciary. And I think we aspire to be a place where any member of the public should be able to access whenever they feel that their rights have been infringed upon. And therefore it should not, um, uh, instill any kind of fear or panic when you consider going to court. Um, my invitation is to share with you on um, the role of the judiciary in the custody and maintenance uh, cases. Um, and I'm glad to do that because I have been at the Children's Court in Nairobi for the last, uh, this is my fifth year now. Uh, just by way of an introduction, Miliman Children's Court is uh, the largest children's court in Kenya. It exclusively deals with cases uh, of child custody and maintenance. We also deal with uh, criminal cases, 
um, where children are accused. And we also deal with the cases where uh, children are said to be in need of care and protection. So whereas I'm going to restrict myself today uh, to the topic on uh, child custody and maintenance, it would be good for the participants to appreciate that over and above those cases, the children court also deals with other matters. Um, for example, when a child is left abandoned somewhere in the streets, they come to our court uh, under the cases we are calling cases uh, of children in need of care and protection, and we make commit orders. I know my brother, uh, Mr. Philip Nzenge is very familiar with that, and I know he will be making his own presentation. Now, very quickly, to for the sake of time, to the, uh, the topic of discussion from the courts. Uh, the role of the, the judiciary and especially uh, the children courts in this regard uh, is a very primary role when it comes to cases of child maintenance and custody for the simple reason that the law has given the children courts the mandate, what we call the primary mandate to deal with uh, cases of custody and maintenance. It is a court of first instance. Before a party goes to the high court, they first must file their cases before the children court. Uh, the matters we are talking about, that is custody and maintenance. For those you might probably be able to reach uh, to get to see the law, is covered under part, part seven of the Children Act. Uh, if you go to that act, sections 81 all through to 89, they seek to address issues to do with the custody. Uh, sections 90 all the way to section 100 seek to address the issue of maintenance because those two normally go hand in hand. Ordinarily when parents are able, are not able to um, <clears throat> agree on co-parenting in the event of separation, usually the questions that follow will be number one, who goes with the children? And number two, how do we provide for them during the time of separation? And the court therefore plays a very important role because whenever there's a dispute, uh, and a dispute normally in the law we say it's when there's one party saying one thing and the other party saying another. It means they are not able to reach common grounds and therefore a dispute arises. Now, when that dispute arises, the first point or port of call usually is the courts. Now, I have a lot of looking at the role of the courts um, in three different ways. Number one is uh, the primary role is to hear and determine custody and maintenance disputes between the parents are no longer, that are no longer living together or between parents who never lived together in the first place because children can come in different ways. But in the eyes of the court and the eyes of the law, a child is a child regardless of the manner by which uh, it was begotten. So I am looking at the role of the court from the perspective of the hearing and the determination of those disputes. I, I know I joined you, but uh, uh, Madam Dulo, I think she may have addressed the process of getting to court. Now you are in the court. The role of the court is that of a referee. Um, I would draw an analogy of a football match where you have two sides and uh, a referee in between, blowing the whistle to start the game, blowing the whistle to end the game, and calling the whistle when there's a foul. 
That is ideally the first role the court plays. Now, in the beginning, we used to have instances where parties would file cases, and then it would be a free fall. Sometimes a case will go for seven, eight years, nine years without being resolved. I must admit that even as we speak, we have not done enough, in my view, to uh, speed up the trial of those cases. But I will also say that uh, we have seen a tremendous improvement in terms of uh, the duration of time the cases take in court, which is usually born out of many factors. But for us, for, for now, I think um, our focus would be the court playing that first role of getting to hear um, the parents, in the course of making a determination on custody, what the court does is to apply the law. Now, what the law says is that both the mother and the father have equal rights in exercising their parental responsibility over the children. The only preference that the court, rather the law seems to take is uh, when you're dealing with uh, custody of children who are of, of, very, uh, of very young age. Uh, the law talks of a child from 10 years and below. That child is taken to be a child of tender years. And the courts over a period of time have developed in the law to suggest that when the court is called upon to determine the question of custody of a child of tender years. The first consideration is that all factors being equal, the child should be taken or given to the mother. Um, and I think the, the rationale or the reason behind that is more natural than illegal because uh, there's always an argument, and I think a good argument at that, that mothers are better at nurturing. So if the court is confronted with a question of determining who should take custody, <coughs> of a child of tender years when parents are not living together, then all other factors being equal, the law says that give that child to the mother. I know sometimes people think that courts have a tendency to favor uh, mothers. No, we don't. We apply the law and we say that if there is no evidence that this mother is a drunkard, that this mother is given to going out there with other people and coming at the middle of the night, that this mother uh, is not immoral. If all these factors are not present, then as a matter of course, the court is likely to give custody to the, to the, to the mother. Um, however, and this is upon now the fathers, if for example, you know, and, and I don't think anyone else knows your partner more than you do, if upon the separation, you feel you have sufficient evidence that if Eva were to give, or rather if the children were to be left with the mother, then she's not likely to give them the care, uh, the care and control that is, of, uh, is necessary for a child of that tender age. If you were to present that evidence in the court, then the court most likely, if persuaded that indeed, the mother is not a good mother, would also give custody to her father, even if the child is of tender age. Um, and I really uh, hope that we are able to appreciate why all this comes about. Now, um, when it comes to children who are from now 11 years all the way to 18, because again, these are deemed to be children until when they celebrate their 18th birthday. When it comes to custody of such children, again, the law starts from the point and the courts start from the point that both parties have equal rights 
and the responsibilities over the children. Now, the court will move to the second consideration, which is who between the two is the most suitable. And suitability is a very, um, is a very circumstantial issue. As a father or as a mother, you may love your children so much, and there's evidence on record that indeed you do. But you might have a job, for example, which obligates you to frequently travel out of the country, you know, or obligates you to work extra hours. And the courts must address that issue and say, even if you were to be given custody, how much of the time is it available for you to spend with the children? So again, all factors being equal, uh, the court will look at the question of which among the two parents is most suitable to have custody. However, and if you have some uh, place to note, you can also note for those of us who are members of the public and who might not have much knowledge on the law, you can also note section 83 of the Children Act. It will give you a list of factors that the court normally considers when um, it is giving custody, including what we call the wishes of the child herself or himself. And the law talks about ascertainable wishes because a child who is in a, um, at an age where they can express themselves, the court will always give them a hearing just to get to hear where they are most comfortable. However, the court does hear the child, but with a lot of caution, because children by their very nature will always tend to incline to a parent who is more friendly. And a parent who is more friendly does not necessarily mean that they are the best parent. Um, sometimes we, as a, as, a, as a parent, when you want to obtain a favor from the child, you will look the other way, even when they, they, they are truant. You will buy sweets, you will come with some enticements, so that even if that child now were to come to court and ask them, as a court, I ask them, um, do you want to stay with the mom or you want to, to stay with the dad? Obviously, they're likely to give me an answer, uh, which may be influenced by other factors. And as a court and as a judge, we have a higher duty now to go beyond those answers, to look at the totality of the evidence so that we are able to discern as to whether the wishes expressed by the child are indeed in their best interest. And I will say this because in my five years around here, I have seen cases where the children come and when they start talking to me, I can clearly see that they have been uh, influenced. The message I would like to share with you is that it doesn't really matter to court because if a court is very careful to evaluate the entire evidence, then ultimately we end up making the right decision. And it should it happen that uh, the right decision has not been made. Uh, please always understand that by design, the courts are set in a way that they allow you room for appeals. Uh, you can always move a step further to one court to the other in terms of high court, uh, court of appeal, just like that, just in the, in the event that you feel something was considered that which ought not to have been considered and vice versa. Uh, I'm seeing a number of questions running through as we share. But I, I would suggest, because I know we will have a Q&A session, uh, those questions can be consolidated and then we share them if time will permit. Uh, and I will move very quickly now to the issue of uh, uh, maintenance. And as the judiciary and by extension in the courts, we always proceed from the point of law. The applicable law when it comes to how children are to be maintained is itself found in the constitution. Again, if you might want to note, 
Article 53, sub Article 1, Paragraph E of the Constitution, states that every child has a right to parental care and protection, and it is the obligation of both the mother and the father. It is never the obligation of the father. And I am saying that because I know we are Africans and uh, African communities are patriarchal. Um, so that there's always an inclination to load more responsibilities for the children on the part of the fathers. But that is not the law. The law looks at both parents as equal and therefore they bear equal parental responsibility. The only thing that we should perhaps uh, discuss a little more is a question of how then does a court determine uh, the equality of that responsibility? It is not a simple mathematics of two divided by uh, one. No, the, the court is called upon to look a little more than that, to look at the question of even in this equality, who has more financial means than the other. It is very unlikely, even if you were to take to undertake some, uh, some research on your own, it is very unlikely that you will have a couple or you will have a parent, father and mother earning sa the same amount. Uh, therefore the court, and again, you can make reference to section uh, 94, subsection one of the Children Act, the court is called upon to look at a number of factors to help it determine how to share out parental responsibility. For example, you will be looking at the financial means of both the parties. You will be looking at the question of their liabilities because normally when we earn money, we do a budget and they say this will go for food, this will go to housing and all that. You look at the financial liabilities between the parties you also must look at the needs of the child because children have different needs at different stages of their lives. So you must also have regard to that fact. You must also look at whether there are other children to be taken care of. Sometimes we have a custody case involving one child, but we have a parent who has three other children. So the court must also have regard to that. Then you must also look at as to whether there is any other person with a responsibility for the same child. I will give you an example very briefly so that you understand that point, that you may have a scenario where a, a mother is married when they already have one child with a different father. Even in the situations where the new husband now assumes some degree of parental responsibility, the court must look as to whether the other man, who is actually the biological father of the child, is also taking care of the same child. So that we don't have scenarios where you have the, the stepfather providing for the child uh, at so much, yet there's another father, biological father somewhere who also is providing or ought to be providing. So those are the things we normally look at when we are dealing with the matters of maintenance. Now, by coincidence, and I think this is a public knowledge, if you look at the society today, I, I, I think many still have more opportunities, more job opportunities than women. It therefore does happen that when we come to court, you might realize that a man is being asked to provide a little more than the, the mother. This is not to say that the court looks with kind eyes to the mothers. Again, it is the society, it is the current setting. Probably one day, one time when the boy and the girl child have equal opportunities at work, then the court will be able to apply the equality principle on a 50-50 basis. So that is what I would say about uh, custody and also maintenance. The other role the court plays is the role of uh, screening. We screen all the cases that you file 
before us uh, as a children court uh, in order to advise as to whether there's a different way in which the cases can be dealt with other than uh, fighting in court. I will have a look at the case and say, I feel this is a matter which can be dealt, through, uh, dealt with through mediation, uh, either through the court annex mediation or even through the, 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 the society. Sometimes you can have church elders, you can have relatives sit down and say, we don't need to go to court. Can we address this and that? So that if you file that case, and I strongly feel that this is not a case we should be dealing with. Our first uh, observation is that, can you first go and try this and that? So I'm saying the judiciary has a role to screen those cases that you file, to recommend or with a view to making a recommendation on a different way, an alternative dispute resolution way that is much better than fighting in court. Um, Allow me to just give an example so that you see uh, what we mean. Sometimes we have a case where one parent of the child is deceased, is dead. So we have one surviving parent fighting for custody with the in-laws of the other parent who is uh, deceased. And you look at a scenario where you're saying the mother is not there, she's dead. It is the father fighting it out with the in-laws and the vice versa. Uh, in, in, our, in, in our thinking, these are cases which do not necessarily need to come to court. And if they do, then we hold a bit and say, wait, can we try mediation? Uh, because again, as I said, we are Africans and it's always good to try and go back to our default setting. The default setting for an African is actually the village where elders can sit and say, is this something we can do to help uh, resolve the dispute? So that is a role we also play. Um, of course, we also have a role to play in terms of the, the fast tracking of cases that are filed before the courts. Uh, we have a role to play in terms of not dwelling so much on technical issues. I know sometimes as a mother, you may sit and say, I, need, I want to go to court, but I have no idea where to start. I don't even know what documents to take. Um, and that in itself may hold you back. You may feel you are not able to go to court for the reason that the technical aspects of the law, you are not able to cope with. Now, uh, when we made our constitution, the 2010 constitution, we, one of the very primary principles that we put in there, again, if you may want to note down article 159, sub article two, I think it's paragraph D, the judiciary and the courts are called upon by the constitution to give justice, what we call substantive justice, without dwelling so, so much on technical issues. Um, so that a court should be in a position, for example, to hear you, even when you have maybe left one paragraph in an affidavit, so that we, 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 we focus on the best interest of the child without necessarily dwelling on whether you have put a paragraph here or whether you filed this document on time. So sometimes the law obliges us to look the other way, even when there's no total compliance with the requirements of the filings, the requirements of how the document should be arranged. Uh, we should have a situation where the court is going out of its way to accommodate parties uh, who are not able to appreciate fully the procedures of the court. So I think that is basically how I look at the court. But at the back of your mind, please always remember, and this is especially for the members of the public, always remember that it is always going to prepare for your case well, because the first rule of the court is that I am a referee. 
I don't get into playing the ball at all. So I only need to hear what one side is saying and hear the other side. Now for purposes of the children cases, because what I know happens in court is that all the cases that you file before us, they come under what we call certificate of urgency. Uh, in other words, for a mother, a child case is urgent. It is filed today, they want to have answers tomorrow on the same day. Now, we please do understand us that the law also requires that we must not condemn without hearing the other side. So that even when you file your case today, it is very urgent and burning, yes, I know. But please remember the law requires that they serve the other side so that they can also have an input in the case before we make the orders. It is on very select cases where we can make an order. For example, if you come and tell me that the father of the children is, is from, uh, from America and he is flying tomorrow morning with the children, I will be able to give an order to stop the flying. I will give an order that let the children remain in Kenya as I get to hear the other side. Otherwise, I think that's the little I would wish to share with you for now. I suspect we will have a number of questions arising out of that, um, but I believe we'll be able to share together as well at that point. Thank you, uh, LSK, thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Honorable Kitonga, for the immense knowledge. A lot has been shared that is of benefit to both advocates on board and uh, the laymen here. There's a lot to learn. Uh, the numbers keep increasing. We are standing at 224, which is quite impressive. The questions are streaming in, keep coming, uh, compiling so that uh, as we address the questions, uh, they can be addressed all at once. So I see Mr. Nzenge is back. For those of us who did not come, uh, who would not um, had not come on board, Mr. Nzenge is the county, Mombasa County Children's Coordinator, and uh, he'll be taking us through the role of the children's officer when it comes to cases of uh, child maintenance and custody. Mr. Nzenge, Karibu Sana. Okay, thank you, Joy, and thank you, the Honorable Gitonga and Madam Erinka, who had actually spoken, and uh, I'm happy that uh, they were able to bring quite a lot. The uh, Mombasa. We have the mandate of uh, ensuring the protection on the rights and welfare of the child. And for any children officer in this republic is mandated to ensure that the rights and the welfare. And there is where it becomes very necessary for us as well to give what our roles when we are doing the custody and the maintenance. Uh, you'll find that in most of the cases, the custody and maintenance, uh, they are in the twin in a way. And basically when you're handling the custody, at some times you'll find that you are as well dealing with the maintenance and the vice versa. However, the custody will dwell so much in the courts. But I want to say this to the public who are here today and who are listening, that the maintenance, we times and it within our office, and it has been said very well by our Honorable Gitoga, that uh, I don't know if it's Gitoga or Madam Erinka, that when you have an agreement from an office, that is a children's office, it's very important that the agreement should be taken to the court for the adoption as the court document. Otherwise, it will be just in the office, and when somebody will come and challenge it, they will not have the legal backing. I must say, uh, in the Department of Children's Services, uh, there are three sections when you are dealing with the custody and maintenance. The first section is section two of the Children's Act, because that is our, actually our holy Bible. When we are dealing with the child, we must refer heavily and uh, in a big way to the Children's Act 2001, of which I know it is under challenges because sometimes it's in consistency with our constitution. But we are actually working to come up with uh, the, the most recent uh, document which will serve the child without contradicting the constitution, which is actually the supreme law. Uh, the chapter, and the section two of the Children's Act, it talks about the safeguarding, the rights, and the welfare of the child. 
Uh, it is very interesting that at that bit, an officer must be familiarized with that section because it gives the rights of the child. It talks of uh, what uh, it was said by one of the speaker, what are the considerations, what are the paramount, what do you check after as you're handling the child. Actually, it is in a way trying to give us the, 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 the background, the originality of our basis. And, and you remember when you are dealing with the matters of the child in custody and medinas, we are only looking at the child. Many times the parties may think that we are interested in any of the parties. That's not the thing. We are only basing our argument to the child and looking at the best interest of the child, which is in the section four of Children's Act. It's very clear that in any matter which is being handled administratively or by anybody, any person who is dealing the issue of a child, of the child is of paramount. It is in the same section where we get uh, what I may call the abuses. Uh, where, what are the rights? It's things like non-discrimination. Who has the parental, the parental care is the right of a child. We talk of uh, the education, we talk of the health. We talk also of the rights of a disabled child. And the moment we are working as a children officer, we must be very clear and we must be very thorough that we understand what do we want to see for this child. This time is not about the couple. We are looking basically to the child and ensuring that the child is not finding himself or herself to this kind of a conflict. So we are actually standing for the interest of the child and that's very important for us. Uh, from there, you look at the section three of the Children's Act, very important again. It talks of the parental responsibility because you will not pick somebody from the market and say this person, your owner has the responsibility for this child. So you must be sure does this person have the parental responsibility? That's very key when you're actually working as a children officer because uh, we all know that the child we believe and we know as a mother and as a father, but there must be some arrangement. And it is very clear on that section on when do you acquire parental responsibility, very key. Sometimes you can acquire parental responsibility by accepting to be responsible. Sometimes it's by just having married and you get a child during that time. Other times is that you are not married, but on the process, you came to the, uh, uh, that agreement when the child was born, and then you get inside, you acquire parental responsibility. And that sometimes brings a lot of confusion when you are dealing mostly with my uh, colleagues, the men, because they say, this child is not mine. And then you go to section two, you find the child has been discriminated. And according to the UNCRC, that's the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, you shall never uh, uh, discriminate a child for whatever reason. So the moment you are saying, after seeing the child for eight good years, and then you come here, you say, no, you know this child is not mine. I think now you are going against the law. And that's why we usually say that, is this one checked in so that the child will not suffer psychologically or emotionally? Because this is a child who is not interested on the conflict between the family. He's only interested in the rights and the welfare. Now we go now to chapter eight, where we have the custody and maintenance in the Children's Act. And we look at it again. And uh, this one is very, it's very technical sometimes uh, because you must understand what is the custody. What is the, that, the, because the custody is about having the parental responsibility and how, which ways can you acquire the custody? These are very technical actually uh, matter when we are handling it, most of the time we refer to the court and we are happy that uh, uh, the children's court, they do it very well. We know we have the actual custody, we have the legal custody, and we have even the care and control where the child is. Those are things we check before we do anything. And remember that again, as we work as a children officer, we must also be very clear on section 114. Here is where we have the orders from uh, the Honorable Itonga. And you must be sure of what are the orders which are likely to be issued. You must look at them so that you may know and advise this the order which actually is likely to come so that you can know is the child likely to suffer or to benefit. And after now elaborating the children's act in that manner in a summarized way, don't forget that we have also to use the other document. The constitution is there. Initially, you know, if you look at the children's act, uh, education was not compulsory. So you could not take somebody to any court. It was going there as a civil case, but now, uh, education of a child is uh, actually a criminal issue 
it's a constitutional right and you cannot remove it from the child. So if you are not taking a child to any education, the child can go to the court through somebody or through the child himself or herself, and that becomes a criminal offense because you are denying that child what we call constitutional, uh, constitutional gains. I, I must say, with, after saying that, I had, had to summarize, because when you look at the children officer, is the voice of the child, and that's how it should be. And he should always be listening to know is the child safe? Not about the paternity this time. We are looking at the parental responsibility. And I want to say something small there, because we have been getting uh, some cases on uh, parental responsibility. Uh, maybe a child was in school and has been going, and at 18, the child is still in form three. And maybe you had, uh, you had some orders, you had some Medina's orders. And because the child has say, attained what we call the age of majority, that is over 18, now you say, no, I'm through. You can't be through, because when you look at the section two of uh, Children's Act, it, it talks of uh, some other needs there, the education. You cannot leave this child on the way. And because of that is when you go to parental uh, responsibility, when you look at the section 26 of Children's Act, it talks of the extension of parental responsibility. It can be extended if the court is convinced that this child needs has some other needs, which has to be given to or be taken. And if the court under the Honorable Gitonga and other Honorable Magistrates, if they are convinced this child is a disabled child, you cannot leave a disabled child because they are the maintenance orders, they've gone up to 18, then you must actually continue serving this child. And these cases have been coming when sometimes uh, the parties, they say, no, look at this, I'm okay, I've done what I was doing, and now if the child is in 18, is a man, is a woman, let her take care of herself. No, because of the Children's Act is very clear, there is a, what you call the clause, there is a, the provisions to ensure that uh, you continue. Now, after looking at all that, it's very important to understand that the moment you attain the parental responsibility, that's something else very important. It never ceases. So you cannot reach a time and say, no, I don't have any responsibility until the age of my ma majority has been attained. All the time you'll be there, you'll ensure that you take care of the child until that time. And that brings another confusion when we have things like divorce and all that. Because uh, some parties, they say, no, this child was in mine, so I'm not responsible. I don't want anything from this child. So long you took care of the child, you acquired parental responsibility and you have to continue with it. Uh, in a nutshell, a, a children officer guides the parties. Now I want actually to give the roles now in a, a better way after seeing how we base our argument. It guides the parties on their role. The moment we call them in the office, uh, we usually used to call it with someone. We don't someone now, we call them so that we discuss on the matters of the child. Because the moment you use the word summoning, uh, one of the party feels aggrieved and can even arm the child. So we call them to discuss, and it is the, the provision of Children's Act. We guide them, the parties, on what is expected of them. So that even if the matter will go to uh, the court, to the Honorable Gitonga, the party knows what is expected. Two, so you'll find we have the right to move the court. So long we are convinced by Section 4 of the Children's Act in the best interest of the child, we are convinced as the children officer that this child is not getting what should be actually entitled to the child in the section two. Then we can go to the court and we can move the court on behalf of the child. As the voice of the child, the children officer should play a custodian role, not to the mother, not to the father. It is to the child. And if the children officer can convince with what actually the Honorable Gitonga talks about as a, 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 a sustainable uh, evidence, that this child is likely to suffer if the father is not going to give the money for the school. If the honorable court gets that one, I believe, and it happens, that you get the orders, even if it's interim orders, as you wait for the determination of the matter. You'll find again, you will also do the supervision of the order. I, that's why it talks about section 114. There is access order, there is production order, and many other orders which are given by the honorable court. The children officer, in conjunction with the police, they ensure that they survive some of those orders. One of the good orders we survive many times is the access order. Uh, that one, we ensure that if it has been given, we, we, we consult the police, the OCS, and we ensure that 
it has been done. And we supervise it, and those are the orders we do as children of God. I have to say that we do arbitration, which we call mediation. Before even the matter goes to the court, you'll hear uh, most of the parties mentioned, we were in this children's office. We are in Mombasa Children's Office. We were at Likoni. We were at Kibera. Those key issues, you'll hear them. And during that time is when we do mediation, as he has said. I know we are not so much trained, but we look at, does this issue, does it need to go all through to the court? Is it in the best interest of the child? And then we try to talk to the party, if they can agree. And what I would like to say uh, to the people who are listening today, if at all the agreement has been reached in any of our office, kindly ensure through our office that the same has been uh, uh, adopted in our court, so that in time something will go differently, you can use that document. We also do the linkages of the parties to the service provider. Uh, I think and Lika I talked about FIDA. FIDA is in many places of this country. Uh, we also have what we call the NLS, National Legal Aid. They are also quite, we have some in areas in this country. In other areas like Endoret, Nairobi, I'm not sure about Nairobi, Endoret, Endoret uh, and uh, Mombasa, we have what you call clear. So we attach them so that they prepare the documents because some of these uh, people who are coming to our office, they are very poor. They come even looking for us to assist them even sometimes with the food. So it is us now, we link them, we link them to those offices and we support them so that they can have the matters taken to the court. I want to say this as I finish. There are a few things you need to consider because after you do all that, the court orders the children officer to come up with what we call social inquiry report. And it's very key. That is the guide. It helps the court to make a decision because um, Honorable Gitonga is in the chambers and is waiting for children officer to bring a quality Having done the consideration, for example, I want to make a, 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 a good example is a child was staying in a posh uh, estate. And after the father and the mother had the wrongs, they want to take a child somewhere else. The child is likely to suffer emotionally and psychologically. It is a children officer who should know in a change of the circumstances, how will it affect this child? Maybe this child used to go to school with a BMW, and then you have changed, you want the child to go to school with a border border simply because you have parted. It's not in the best interest of the child because the child will suffer emotionally. And it's the children officer who should bring out all those issues on the social inquiry report. And that is basically what you do. We ensure that we do that. We have also to look at other issues of uh, custody, which sometimes they are not so much linked to the court. It's not about the battle, it's not about the conflict but it's only as a service to the child. We look at the, the conduct, the, the, what are the wishes of the parent. Sometimes some parents, even one has, has passed on, they can actually have somebody else because testamentally a guardian. So they have to say this, we look at the wishes. We look also sometimes at, at the child, what is the wish? But I want to say this, the, the wish of the, the best wish of the child is not equal to the best interest of the child. And I'm lucky, I'm happy that uh, Honorable Bogitoga has said that. Uh, sometimes a child will go where he is, he is let loose. And that's not the best interest. He would like to go to the person who is not even looking at issues like education, the development of the child. So very important. You have to look at the best wish and the best interest of the child. Those two must be agreeing. And if they are not agreeing, we go to the best interest of the child. We, we look at uh, other things like religious persuasion. When you are putting a child to any custody, uh, is the where is the child? Is it a, a Christian? Is it a Muslim? You have to know, even if when they are fighting, so that you don't interfere with the right of the child to religious observation. Otherwise, you may place a child somewhere where the child will suffer simply because he's a custody or this person is rich and you are not looking at other factors. Very important. And then you look at other orders which were made. Some people are restricted from having the child. So you cannot go and give the child the custody. In your report, and in our report, we don't recommend. We look if there were other orders which were done before. But in nutshell, Section 4 of the Children's Act is very key to us. The best interest of the child, and that is something we must ensure, that when we are serving any child, we pull the child from the conflict, and we look at the best interest of the child, and as a children officer, we ensure that interest is given. And the moment it's done like that, the two parties feel okay. Because it's uh, actually it's a kind of a Solomonic interpretation. 
whereby you are saying it is not about the child, it is about you too. And many times we find we have a, a bit of a, a, an ammonia society because we do not take sides. I usually tell my colleagues, if you cannot reduce the gap of the conflict, you better leave it the way it is. Don't enlarge it. Don't take sides. And after you do that, you'll find that we have harmonious and a cohesive society best for our children to drive to responsible citizens. Thank you. Over to you, Joyce. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Philip Nzenge. I think there's so much to learn. If someone could just get a notebook and write, you can write and write and write. So whatever you've said, there's much you've had, there's much you've been told, but you've had it from the horse's mouth. Um, at this point, I want to take us down to the questions. I've tried compiling them. I can tell you they are so, 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 so many. Um, just to reiterate what Madam Helena Missy said in the beginning, there are so many questions that are inclined to adoption, divorce, which is a bit off from today's theme. And uh, we had a side talk that we're going to have a specific forum where we're going to talk in much depth about matters adoption, matters divorce. So allow me, if you feel like I ignored your question and it was inclined to divorce and uh, matters adoption, can you there with me for today? So I'll start with the questions that I feel were directed to Madam Enrica Dulo, if she's still with us. And uh, the first one was, how do you handle maintenance and custody um, cases for a parent who's out of jurisdiction? Thank you, Joy. Now, I'm assuming that the parent against whom orders are being sought is the one out of jurisdiction. So based on that assumption, if uh, it's a mother going to court seeking for maintenance orders against a father who is out of jurisdiction, if you are my client, I would advise you not to because of lack of enforceability. Yes, you will get orders, but enforceability. And this also will depend on which country the father is. If he is in the UK, then we will proceed because it's very easy to enforce such orders on maintenance against parents if they are in the UK. As an advocate, I will not go to court simply for going to court or because I want to make money out of my client. I would advise you, after you get those orders, will they be enforceable? However, if they have property in Kenya under their name, and you are aware of this property, and you are aware that it's an income generating property, even if they are out of Kenya, then we would go to court. But where they are not in Kenya, they are not based in the UK, and they don't have property in Kenya, then I would tell you that to me, that's an effort in futility. Sometimes it's good you just count your losses. Yes, the father is deadbeat. He should be providing, he's not providing, but unfortunately it is what it is. Yes, thank you. Thank you. That was brief and to the point. Um, the next question to you is, uh, what's the difference between legal custody, physical custody, and joint custody? Okay, L legal custody. Now, again, if you look at uh, the Children Act, I believe this is in uh, section, uh, oh, is it 80 or 81? Now, legal custody means that both parents have to be involved in decision making, and it's not all decision making. Of course, there are some nitty gritty ones where the parent with actual custody needs to make, and others where both parents need to make. So, when it comes to legal custody, what are the decisions that both parents must jointly work together on? One is a choice of school. If it's the father being if it's the father's responsibility to pay the school fee and the children ordinarily reside with the mother, then the mother cannot up them from Kilimani Junior to Brookhouse because she's not the one paying the fee. That responsibility has to be discussed jointly. Uh, the one parent cannot just up them and decide, you know what, I'm relocating with these children outside the jurisdiction. Both parents have to agree. 
So those are just the few examples. Or even in cases of circumcision, there are commu a lot of communities in Kenya circumcise. One parent cannot just decide, you know what? I'm taking this boy for circumcision. Whereas culturally, circumcision is done, the man who is the father to those children was circumcised and he would accept for the children to be circumcised, but he needs to be involved in the decision making and even where the child is going for circumcision because apart from the health benefit, this is also cultural. So the father would wish also to be part and walk the journey with the son. So these are just some of the examples when um, on legal custody. Then a joint custody. Joint custody means that no parent has an exclusive right over the other. And this is tied to actual custody so that even though and often the mother has actual custody, meaning she gets to live with the children more often on a day to day. But because of joint custody, the father will have access to the children over the weekend. The access may be day or overnight and also that they get to share the holiday. Often the holiday is 50-50 or as parties may want to agree. Thank you. Next question. Um, the other one is pretty simple. You have answered it uh, in your presentation and in your answers. Uh, must custody come after a divorce? No, 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 no. These are cases that are handled by two different courts. If you are in Nairobi, then the children registry is distinctive and different from the commercial magistrate's registry where you'd file divorce. But I'd give you an example. You file a case probably at Ngong Law Courts or at Kajado Law Courts, or let's say Mbita Law Courts, where it's one magistrate or two magistrates. But still, it's not one case. The divorce case will be filed and it has, it's being filed under its own register. Children case is filed and under its own register, even where it's both cases go before the same magistrate in a small judicial station where there's only one magistrate sitting. But those are two different cases. And oftentimes I get asked by litigants, must I wait for the divorce before I can uh, pursue children case? I tell them no, because divorce case normally does not drag as much as the children case does drag. And children case will drag for a very long time. And sometimes even after you think you are done with the court, you open your email pop up and uh, there's a, a new demand letter or a new application because the process will go on until they are 18. And even after they are 18, section 28 of the Children Act provides that one parent can go to court for enhancement of parental responsibility. So the simple answer is no. You file them in different courts and both cases can run concurrently. You do not have to necessarily wait unless your waiting is financial, that I cannot afford to pay an advocate for children case when divorce proceedings are ongoing. But if uh, finance is not the issue or you can self-represent, then both cases can run concurrently, even in a station where it's only one judicial officer who will be seized of both matters. Okay. Uh, you've responded again to your last question, which was your experience as a lawyer. Um, how long do children cases take? Um, child custody cases, child maintenance cases. You just responded, but you may just reach as rich as you are in the <laughs> <laughs> Yes, this, I, I mean, any practicing advocate shall have come across that question when you are instructed. Yes. And uh, some litigants are very pushy and be, they believe that they can perform some magic and the court diary will have 90 days in a week. So unless you are seeking interim orders, normally I tell them, give it minimum six months. And also the interim orders will depend on what specific interim orders are you seeking? Is it a child who is sick and very sick where you're used to managing, very sick where a father must provide or they are holding the medical card. So the minor is unable to access medical services or they are in school 
And it's a school where they've always been enrolled at, but after the separation, all of a sudden, the father does not want to pay school fee. So these are the instances where you will get interim orders almost immediately and sometimes not necessarily after interparty hearing. But as a litigant, I would tell you when you go to court to be patient, I would give you minimum six months if it's a substantive suit where it's an application. Remember, after you file, you will be given a date, you serve the other party. And uh, once you, you are finished with all your replies, then submissions and the court gives a ruling. And in between, depending also on your advocate or on your temperament, there will be application after application springing up. And uh, the truth is sometimes also as advocates, we, have to, we like pushing our clients to make application after application. And, uh, and some, some advocates, they do this because with each application in court, they know that they'll be raising a fee note. So just be patient when you go to court and give yourself a minimum of six months. Thank you. Couldn't be answered better. Thank you so much, Madam Hendrik Tegulo. In case there are other questions that you need to address, can we request that you hold on so that you may respond to them. So the next questions are directed to you, Honorable Kitonga. Uh -huh. So does equal parental responsibility apply where one party lacks a source of income? Say, um, this is a mother who's applying for maintenance and uh, the man is not employed. So how does it go from there? Kindly unmute. Thank you. Thank you for that. And before I answer the question, allow me to also associate myself with the answers given by my friend uh, uh, Esther Dulo. And I also want to help her to break down a little more the question of legal and actual custody, the difference. Uh, because sometimes it's usually not very easy for persons who are not uh, learned in law. Uh, very simply put, when you're talking of legal custody, uh, these, these are, it's, I would call them a bundle of rights that a parent normally have by reason of being a parent. You cannot touch them. That's why I'm just calling them a bundle of rights. For example, the right to name a child, the right to determine where the child will go to school, just like what she repeated, or rather she said, the right to determine if it is a question of circumcision, when it should be done and where, so that no parent can really uh, touch what you call legal custody as such. So even though we use the word custody, it doesn't mean that it is something you are keeping physically. So that is what we call legal. But when you're talking of actual custody, this is the physical possession of the child, where a person is saying, give me the child, he will be staying with me at this and that address. And invariably, as long as paternity is not disputed, parties should share legal custody jointly. Because no mother, no father has a, an equal, a rather a greater right than the other in terms of parenting. That is how I would look at it. Now, very quickly to the question now of, of how to address the issue of equal parental responsibility, even, even where um, one, one parent is not working. I will say this, that uh, ordinarily, every parent has a parental responsibility over their child. If you look at the decisions that we have made as courts, including the, the Court of Appeal, the inclination is that the court will not accept as an excuse that a parent is not working and therefore they will not be given any responsibility for a child. In fact, I remember this, uh, I'm not able to give the part, uh, our, our participants the case, the, the particular case, but I, I remember the, Honorable Justice Mother Kome, making it very clear that this court is not prepared to allow a party to run away from parental responsibility for the reason that they are not working. However, what the court does is that 
we we look at what we call um, equal but differentiated treatment. If you can take it that way, uh, you are looking at a parent who can only wash clothes, do casual labor, for example, to get something small. Let's say, let's say 200 shillings per day. That is the best they can in their own circumstances to support the child. The other party is earning, let's say, 200,000 per month. So when the court now gets into the business of apportioning parental responsibility, the court will graduate their responsibilities proportionate to their earnings. Uh, so that if it is a mother who is just washing clothes, you are earning 200 shillings. That is uh, 1,000 in one week. Then we will say, can you then take the responsibility of buying clothes, for example, for the child? And by buying clothes, you don't need to go to Mr. Price. Uh, because courts have again said that a flashy lifestyle is not equal to, uh, equal to the best interest of the child. If you can only afford to buy some decent second-hand clothing for the child, the court will give you that responsibility. So yes, we graduate um, responsibility proportionate to the income of the parties. Um, thank you so much for that response, Honorable Kitonga. The second question to you is, um, do Cathy courts have jurisdiction over children matters? I was praying that question doesn't arise. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yes, because I know I and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a student of research. I'm currently doing my PhD in law, but in a different field in international law, not actually what I'm currently doing in, uh, in court. Uh, and I'm giving that background because I know in terms of jurisprudence, and this is, I know I will lose some of our, our participants in this. Um, the high courts, the, the court of appeal, the the High Court and even ourselves, we have grappled with the interpretation of, uh, I think it's section, I mean, Article 73 of the Constitution, if I'm not wrong, where it addresses the role of the Cadiz Court in matters of personal law, which, which includes divorce, maintenance, and all, maintenance for the spouse. Now, if you look, if you look at that vis-a-vis Section 73 of the Children Act. Because 73 of the Children Act now is the one that gives the Children's Court exclusive jurisdiction to deal with the children's cases. If you were to apply that section, then you would say the answer is that it is only the children's courts which should deal with the matters uh, dealing with custody and maintenance of the children, not the Cadiz Court. However, and this is for um, intellectual discussion, if you go back to what we call personal law of our brothers who profess Islamic faith, I have every reason to believe that matters to deal with their own children should actually be interpreted to, to, to be part of the personal law so that the Catholic court would be allowed to address divorce, maintenance of the spouse, and by extension, maintenance of their own children. So to me, that should have fallen into the, the ambit of personal law. But then again, I cannot, um, I cannot purport to, to speak beyond what the, the spirit of cause have pronounced themselves. And I think I've given him a yes and a no. Yeah. Okay, that was a very safe answer, quite complete in my opinion. So there's a question that came in. This is from my lawyer, Kennedy. What is the place of uh, the affidavit of means and how should the court proceed once the same is filed? Some judicial officers insist on proceeding by way of submissions when probably they wish to interrogate issues with the affidavit of means. That's Kennedy. Okay. Y yes. Uh... The, the, the affidavit of means, in uh, my view and uh, out of my experience, is, is a very integral part of proceedings 
when you are aiming to determine how, how parties are going to share parental responsibility. It is meant to show what each one of them earn and how they apply that money and what can be left for the children. So to me, and I've seen decisions which we make at the subordinate court at our level, when we have not properly addressed our minds to affidavits of means, and when they go on appeal, the superior courts usually either stay the decisions or they overturn them. The reason is simple, that for you as a court to be able to determine what each parent is going to contribute to the welfare of the child, you cannot afford to pluck figures from the air. You must have a legal basis, a factual basis, to say that the father will give 20,000 and not 10, 15,000 and not 60. So to me, I think it is very integral to the process. As to the question of whether now parties should interrogate, because I think the law was in, uh, looking at a situation where parties would be very candid to file honest affidavits of means. But it also does happen that they don't do so. Um, and remember, these are parties who have lived together probably very recently. So if it is a mother questioning the, 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 the honesty of the means by the father, she is likely to say that I also used to see him, you know, uh, making extra money over and above the salary. Therefore, to me, I think um, it is always good to have an opportunity to interrogate affidavits or means where a party feels that uh, there is something that is not adding up from the other. The question then would be, how do you bring it out to the court? Because we say parties to file affidavit of means, file and serve. Then my thinking is that as a matter of good practice, when there is an affidavit of means filed, but a party is con uh, contesting the contents, the court should allow that party an opportunity to interrogate by way of, uh, even if it's close examination, the contents of that affidavit of means. Okay. I hope, Kennedy, you feel like the question has been responded to sufficiently. Um, there is a question that came, uh, can, a care, can a protection and care file be used as a tool for child maintenance and how far can that be? Well, that, that's, a, that's a unique uh, setting. Um, I, I, I feel, and I, I must apologize. I don't think I have a very outright answer to that. But from my experience, again, I would say that a care and protection file seeks to address unique needs of a child differently from an actual case for child maintenance and custody. However, because if you look again at the provisions of the law, there is a whole list of instances where the, the child would fall into the category of one needing care and protection, including uh, a child who is being threatened with FGM, for example. So it's a whole list. But if the care and protection file is coming purely on the grounds of being needy, the parents are there but have neglected. Three things happen at the same time. Number one, a criminal case is instituted under Section 127 of uh, the Children Act, seeking to punish the children. And simultaneously, for example, if it was one parent, that the, a file for care and protection will be opened. And that parent can also uh, maintain a case for maintenance. So again, the answer is yes and no, depending on the particular issue. Because care and protection is usually a very wide area, which the court is called upon to address. Okay, this one was expressed to you. Question to Honorable Gitonga. Will the court still give custody to minors of tender age to the mother if the mother does not intend to live with the minors? Can a mother get custody while she intends to have the children live with, the, with her parents, considering the father is willing and able to live with the minors? Okay, um, uh, 
I, I think the answer to that question is, is this, that uh, one, we are very categorical that when children are out of tender age, of necessity, custody is given to the mother, unless if there are circumstances which point to the mother being a bad mother. That is one. Number two, where a mother is seeking custody, but for purposes of passing over the children to the grandparents of the children, that is her own parents. The court will say no for this reason. If you were to look at section six, subsection one of the Children Act, uh, the law says that every child has a right to be to live with and be cared for by his parents. So that provision excludes any other third party where circumstances are that both the mother and the father are living and they are shown to be capable of taking care of the children. So we refuse to have scenarios where you just want them, want them and then pass them over, you take them to Muranga and then you continue living in Nairobi. Uh, so that would be the answer and I hope I got the question right. Yeah, you did. And um, the last one, uh, my question is where clients come to our, this is an advocate. My question is where clients come to our offices as advocates and they agree, uh, can we still file the PRA parental responsibility agreements to be adopted as an order of the court, even though the advocate is not a certified mediator or is not a court annexed mediator? Yes, I, I think the answer, the answer is yes. For the reason that uh, a parental responsibility agreement is a complete and a binding document on its own. So it may not matter whether it was drafted by an advocate who probably is not an accredited mediator. It may not matter how it came into being. Uh, because as long as both parties seem to have exercised their free will, either through the guidance of such an advocate or even on their own, then they just need to move to court. And I would add that it doesn't matter again how it comes to court. Because I have seen just today, I think I, I did one where a party had filed a plaint and a chamber summons application seeking to have the parental responsibility agreement adopted. So I, we just relied on the chamber summons. We allowed the application and we marked the entire suit as settled because like I'm saying, the parental responsibility agreement is enough on its own. Okay. Um, from what I have, I've tried to, co to compile the questions. There were quite a number, but I really believe that you have addressed them all. So thank you so much, Honorable Gitonga. Uh, at this point, I want to invite Mr. Philip Nzenge to respond to a few questions again that have been raised by our participants. Um, Mr. Nzenge, are you with us? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Oh, great, great. So the first one is, at what age do you consider, uh, at what age is a child's opinion considered? When they've come to your office, this is a parent who, a mother and a father who've come and they've come with their child. So at what point do you listen to the child's um, opinion? Bearing in mind is something that you say that caught my ears. The best uh, wish of the child is not necessarily the best interest of the child. So at what point will you consider the child's opinion, the child's wish? Okay, thank you. I must say it is not only the age, but the age should be actually above 12 years of age. But again, you consider ability of the child. Sometimes on the growth and development, a child might have had a slow development. So it is upon the children officer to consider apart from the age is the ability and the knowledge equal to what you are, want to make as a decision. Yes. Okay. Quite sufficient, thank you. Uh, the qu next question is, um, how binding is a parental responsibility agreement? <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you. Actually, we say the parental responsibility agreement, it is only binding legally 
when it has been produced to the court of the law, that is the children's court, for the adoption. And for it to be adopted, you must work closely with the children officer so that he can either take it for you to the courts and be something which you have agreed, you are not being forced, is the easiest. I think that's why Honorable Gitoga had said it is true, it is binding. And I think he answered it very well as per my opinion and what I heard from him. Thank you. Um, two more questions to go. I hope you're not yeah. tired. No, so, I'm okay. Great. Is the children's officer's report confidential or the parties can have it? Thank you. It is something which has been coming, I'm happy, and mostly for the adoption uh, reports. I, I want to say that for a children officer to have a report, he has been sanctioned by the court. So the contract between the children officer and the report is uh, to the court. So if you want to receive it from the court, well and good, because it's the court which has ordered. And we give it to the court to use it as per their requirement. So I don't have the authority to give it to anybody else. Otherwise, I'll be going against what the court had told me. Had told me. Otherwise, if it is not uh, 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 precisely for the court, they could have told me you could give so and so because here now it becomes legal. So if you want it, you can get it through the court and I love, the children officer will have no problem with that. But before uh, coming to me, I may not give because I may be interfering the process of the court again. So I must be very careful on that. Thank you. Hi. So this brings us to our last question again in the interest of time. It's four, almost 4.20. Um, someone asks, what is the distribution of children officers in Kenya? Uh, thank you. Uh, that's, I think it touches the human, the human resource, which for now I cannot authentically say this is a match, but uh, what I know in every sub-county, there is an officer and possibly some other uh, officers working under the sub-county children officer. And also in every county of this country, there is a county children coordinator. So in case of any problem, you can reach the county children coordinator because maybe somebody is suffering somewhere. It's a question of, I don't see the children officer. I can actually read the mood and the spirit, but uh, we know that in every sub-county, there is an officer. But uh, you see, although uh, I, now authentically, I cannot say this is the number, because it's a question of HR, that is a human resource, and I may not have that data right now. Thank you. Oh, great. I think that answers a lot of questions. People are concerned about where these children officers and whatever you've told me. There's a time I used to work at the children's helpline, and that is the information we used to give, I used to give to the people who are calling to seek legal help. Yes. There That's is a true. children officer at every um, sub county office. Mahali Mnachpulianga. What was it? ID And it was quite helpful. So yeah. this brings us to the end of my questions. I know I haven't covered all questions. We will sit down as a committee, the people responsible for this, try to address all these questions. This is just a beginner. We'll be having similar sessions to address such issues. And um, as I was going through the questions, there's something that has come out. There's a lot of, um, how do I put this? A lot of people think that there is bias towards um, women when it comes to child um, maintenance and custody issues. The questions were so many um, that were inclined that direction. Why does the court favor women? Can a, can a man um, be granted um, custody of children? There are so many questions. So as you sit down, I think we need to structure something specifically for um, targeting that topic, like what is the role of men in the, in the whole process? What can they do? What can they do? There's anything. So there's a poll that has been launched on your screens. It will take you just a few seconds. In the next one minute, 15 seconds, maybe you can, you can work on it. And as we do this, I want to welcome Mr. Stephen. Um, Joy, Joy, just before you finish. Oh yeah, yes, Madam Erika. There's, there's a question and, that has been asked repeatedly. I'd like Honorable Gitonga to address it. Mm -hmm. Often times you get advocates going to court or self-representing litigants going to court and claiming something that is I've never heard of, but people still insist on it, parental abduction. 
can a parent be charged with taking their child under their custody without the consent of the other parent? And is there is it a crime under the penal code? I, that's a question that keeps coming up repeatedly. I, I wouldn't wish to address it. I'd like Honorable Gitonga to address it. Honorable Gitonga, kindly take up the question, if you don't mind. Honorable Gitonga, if you're with us. Um, Honorable Gitonga, you are still muted. Um, let me ask you. Can you use the chat? Can you use the chat section if you're unable to unmute, please? There he is. Okay. okay, thank you. I think I'm uh, unmuted now. Um, before I answer that question, and I think I'm having a second bite of the sherry, I, I didn't know I would have that opportunity. Uh, the, the feeling, and I'm addressing members of the public on this, the feeling that uh, the courts always uh, have a, a bias or what I would call a soft spot for the mothers. Uh, I know because that has been expressed many times. In fact, uh, when I came to this court uh, in, in 2016, the feeling I got from uh, members of the public was that the, the court, the children court was like an extension of some of these NGOs that deal with the welfare of mothers. And I think it's, it's better that we talk with honesty because I think it's something that was going to pass and addressed. They were, and I won't name the NGOs, but that was the feeling. Allow me to say this, that uh, that is not true. Uh, if anything, I think what the court does try to do is to apply the law. The law has a, an inclination towards mothers, especially when we are dealing with the children of tender years. Uh, and you and I, I don't think we are likely to argue with the law because you know where you have come from at the age of one year, at the age of two years, at, at the age of three years. It is mothers who are better placed to deal with you. However, and I think I made that in my presentation, I said the court does not start the case with a particular inclination in terms of I'm going to give custody to this and that. We only tick boxes. Is a child of tender years? If I tick that box, yes. The next box I tick is a question of, are there any exceptional circumstances that would warrant me taking away the child from the mother? If I tick that box that there, there is, then I will actually give the father custody. But I, if I tick that box to the effect that there are no exceptional circumstances, then automatically the child goes to the mother. It only happens that nine out of 10 times, all those boxes are ticked correctly. The mother takes custody. Now to the question my good friend and counsel has raised about um, whether a parent can abduct. I entertain very strong doubts as to whether a parent can abduct their own child. Very strong doubts. Remember, we are beginning from what we call legal custody, that every biological father and mother, they have inherently some rights accruing by reason of being the, the mother or father. And no one can take that away. And that is why even when we take custody from one parent, we say that the other parent must of necessity access the child. So to me, I think even when it comes to situations where a father, especially during Christmas times, because uh, we want to be seen to have complete families. So sometimes I can go and grab my children if they are living with the mother and put them in the car and drive them to the village. That happens. But I doubt whether we can actually say he abducted his own children and therefore charge him on that basis. It's an issue that needs to be addressed either through mediation 
or through the court process and they will restore custody where it should be. I think that is what I would say. Great. Thanks, Madam Enrica, for raising that. I saw that question and for some reason I noted this down, but I think I've been looking at my watch and thinking, wow, what can I share? What can I share today? So thank you so much to our three panelists for holding this down for us. The questions have been many. Uh, it takes a lot of sacrifice, I mean, time and everything just to be here to respond to the various questions repeatedly. So thank you, Madam Enrica. Thank you, Bonanzenge. Thank you, Honorable Gitonga. We don't take it for granted. And I look forward to more interactions with you. I've just been reminded I didn't introduce myself when we began. My name is Jay Katonge. I work for an NGO that uh, supports the welfare of children. Uh, it's known as Kenya Alliance for Advancement of Children. And at this point, I want to hand over the program to Stephen Saini to give his closing remarks. Karibu, Nabona Thank you. Um, you, you might need to unmute, unmute Stephen from your end, uh, Joy, Madam okay. Joy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, Stephen. Kindly, I've requested you to unmute yourself. Hi, all. Uh, what a session. What a panel. What an engagement, <laughs> what a moderator. I must say this has been a nice event. I've really enjoyed the same. Uh, as we come to the tail end of this program, I wish to thank all who attended this session. We don't take it for granted. As you are heard before, this is the Legal Aid and Public Interest Committee of the Law Society of Kenya Nairobi branch. We, our jurisdiction is within Nairobi and Kiambu, so we deal with legal aid, we offer legal aid to the public and also file public interest litigation cases. So feel free if you have any legal issues and public uh, engagement on legal matters that you may like the branch to take over, please feel free to uh, engage the branch. <clears throat> I wish to thank Honorable Kitonga for agreeing to grace this occasion for us. We don't take it for granted. We know you have a busy schedule but you are able to grace the occasion and give us your expertise. I know I've been in that department in the Children's Court in Nairobi for long, and we appreciate your experience for sharing with us. Thank you so much, Your Honor. <clears throat> I also wish to thank Enrica Dulo. We used to work with you at the Children's Court some time years back, and I see you've kept the fire burning, and you've really assisted us. And thank you so much for agreeing to engage us and engaging our participants. Thank you for your presentation. Philip Nzeke, in Mombasa, your experience, you're actually on the ground and you've given us the real, where the road meets the rubber or the rubber meets the road. <laughs> we really appreciate for your, <laughs> for your real life lessons. Members have really been appreciative of your real examples. I thank the council of the LSK Nairobi branch led by the vice Chair, Helen Namisi. I think I also saw Kennedy Murunga. Uh, please th thank you for overseeing this occasion and see overseeing this program for us. Uh, I thank the co-conveners led by Joy uh, and for ably moderating this program. Uh, I, I also saw Diana and uh, other members of the co-convening and also members of the Legal Aid and Public Interest Committee. Thank you so much for organizing this event. Lastly, uh, sorry, before last but not least, there's a secretariat for arranging this program. Thank you so much for being behind the scenes and making this program a success. Lastly, to our members, participants, for agreeing to come over, attend, plan, and stay over until this session has come to an end. Without you, our plans and efforts will have been in vain. We thank you so much. Please look forward for more programs. We are arranging more programs on different topical issues. We shall collect the questions you've uh, asked that were not answered, either answer them or organize other special events to answer those questions. Please uh, be stay alert. We'll be sending out more invites for area, other areas that affect the public. Also in your areas where you are, you feel some topics needs to be addressed, you can send the 
questions to the LSK Nairobi branch, be able to organize in the different formations that we have. For me, thanks so much, Joy, back to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Bonas Stephen, for your kind remarks. This brings us to the end of a beautiful afternoon session. Uh, I want to thank you all that were able to attend the session. We started up when we were around 280, the number has been dropping, but I'm aware of this curfew and this everything. So I totally understand. I want to register my thank you to you, participants, the panelists, and um, keep alert for, um, Future for future invites to such events because as the committee, this uh, we are geared towards providing information to the masses because the information is held within us. You know something that I do not know, but when we come together, we share. I mean, at the end of it, each of us goes home with something new. So at this point, I want to call off the meeting, remind you to wear your masks, maintain social distance, sanitize, and wash your hands. So have a good afternoon. Is it afternoon or evening? Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, well, thank you. Sorry, I, I was uh, in a in a webinar, but I can take it the call now. Uh, and <laughs>